Hi, this is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is a show where we get to know different members of the LGBTQ community. Today, I had a conversation with Tommy Pico. Tommy is a poet. We talk about his poetry, about writing about sex. We talk about growing up on a Native American reservation and the way that Native Americans are perceived today. It's super interesting. Before we get to it, though, we want to say thank you to everyone who's been leaving five-star reviews on iTunes. It is such a massive help, specifically leaving a comment. Thank you for that. And while we're talking about making good decisions, you can also sign up for the LGBTQ&A newsletter. You can do that at lgbtqpodcast.com to stay up to date on all of our new episodes and live shows and special surprises. So you can do that at lgbtqpodcast.com. Okay, let's get to the interview. Hey, Tommy. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thanks. Thanks. So last time I was in New York, I saw you did a poetry show and you started off by saying that most poetry readings are boring. That's correct. Yours was not. Um, I Thank you very much. I have worked really hard in my poetry career to ensure that when I get on stage, you remember who I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people did. I, it was refreshing to hear a poet say that because I feel like that's something that people say, but not publicly. Yeah, I don't have much room for false humility. But I, I think I think of it as like from high school, like you are forced to read these old poems that maybe you don't have a connection to, or maybe you've read for the first time, so you don't get a meeting, and then we just kind of like hate it yeah. from then on. Well, I think while there is a lot to be learned from quote unquote canonical poetry as it is taught in academic institutions, there is a, just because that is. Um, maybe sort of static and inaccessible. I think people get the wrong idea about what poetry is or is not supposed to be. So one of the my favorite compliments I ever get is when people come up and they're like, I didn't know you could put that in a poem. And I was like, that is, yeah, that's great. Now you can do that too. You know what I mean? Like you can put a tweet in a poem. You could talk about a ghost who gives a blowjob. You could talk about whatever you want to. Um, I think it's just, um, it, it, because it does have a formal tradition, people sometimes think that that's all it could possibly be is something like formal and aloof. Um, and also, unfortunately, a lot of times what gets popularly distributed as like quote unquote poetry is oftentimes not as interesting as what's out on the margins. Like the kinds of work that my friends are making now is really exciting and um, the opposite of boring, you know, it's, it, it's dynamic and, it, and it's, it's loud, you know? Um, but I think people in positions of power are scared by people who are loud. Yeah. I mean, and nothing is off limits for a poem. Right? Like right. topic wise. Right. You you write a lot about sex. Correct. <laughs> uh, I, I bring that up because I have a big issue talking about sex, uh, like in a podcast, let's say, because I don't, that's some, that's, I'll talk about anything you want in life. That's a subject I don't want like my family or parents hearing about. Mm. Do, do, your, do your family read your poems? They sure do. And they've had sex before. I assume they've had sex before. I mean, I'm here. So um, I don't really. Hmm. Maybe I'm fooling myself. I guess I tend to think that like it's audacious to think you have an audience to begin with. So in my mind, nobody cares about it. Nobody's listening to it. Nobody reads it. So I that that helps me to continually produce things. I think in my in, in my creative life, what I try to do in order to continue to make things and to put things out there, I think that could be really scary. It's really exposed. Exposure is exposing necessarily, but a way that I try to get over it is by making the process itself less intimidating. And if I'm intimidated by what an audience could potentially construe from what I make, I just pretend that that audience doesn't exist. So, so that surprises me because you've two books published and two more on the way. That's correct. And you're still able to imagine that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I have a great uh, um, power of denial. <laughs> Have men or boys, or I don't know why I'm saying synonyms, but um, people you've dated ever recognize themselves in your poems? People who I've dated don't really occupy uh, too much of my consciousness. <laughs> I actually have no idea. 
if anyone that I've dated has ever recognized themselves in a poem. I did have somebody come out way back in the day when I was just making zines and I was like leaving them at cafes and, and, and bars and takeout joints and laundromats and shit like that. Somebody did come up to me in the backyard of a bar and he was like, so I read that zine. And there was a poem that was about uh, an encounter that I'd had with this person. And he was like, I, I couldn't help but wonder. And I was like... It, wonder what? And he's like, was that, was I in that poem? And I was like, well, it sounds like you had a reaction to something that I wrote. That's wonderful. What a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> I forget what poem it was, but you wrote something about, I think you were on a date and the guy said something insulting, maybe like a microaggression about being indigenous. And then you talked about sleeping with him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this is not, like you said, this isn't something you usually read about in poetry. Yeah. Especially not the canon. Yeah. 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 Um, It's also like I'm not interested in writing a hero or like a valiant character or a person who would take that microaggression and be like, well, fuck you and like storm out and like flip a table. Although maybe flipping a table would be great. But but, you know, like the fact that this character like is willing to be insulted and still let somebody get it in, you know, that's not who would admit to that? You know, I so I I I like characters who um, do the thing that you might be prone to do and like sort of do it proudly. And I think the scary part of microaggressions is that you can't leave the room every time they happen because they happen often. Yeah. You know, you, you need to continue the conversation. Right. But there are ways in which either, again, like either you ignore them or you call somebody out or I don't know. I think sometimes the, 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 one of the most frustrating things about microaggressions for me personally is that sometimes I don't realize they've happened until like 20 minutes later. And I'm like, wait a minute. I think that was fucked up. Initially, my instinct was that was fucked up. But being like a marginalized person in American society, you have to question your instincts all the time. <laughs> you it, know? Yeah. Isn't that so weird when like a day later you're like, oh God, this thing that one of my best friends who I love said really hurt. Yeah. It doesn't hit you until later. And oftentimes that's what makes it into the poem. I think creative outlets in general offer people a relief from that spirit of the staircase feeling where you're like, oh my God, you get to the bottom of the staircase and you realize what you should have said at the top of the staircase. I feel like it's a French term, which is that exact feeling of like realizing a day later or like having arguments with yourself in the mirror because you didn't say what you had to say to that dude two days ago, you know? Totally. With your poems, you have such a... There's like a Tommy Pico quality to them. Mm-hmm. A lot that has to do with the spelling. You mm-hmm. spell like it's tweet or text message. But I guess I'm impressed by that because it doesn't feel like a gimmick. Mm. You know, because anybody can more or less do that. But there's a thought behind it. So it even made it more impressive. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's funny because sometimes I'll, uh, you know, I'll leave the G off of words. So it's like nothing bothers me, but it's like nothing with an N. But the thing is, like, that's just the way that I talk. So uh, my entire writing process is me trying to approximate on the page a version of the conversation you might have with me. That's why the tone comes across so conversational. And sometimes I've had copy editors in, in journals or whatever where I've had poems published add like an apostrophe at the end of the end, so it like, which is grammatically, well, technically correct, but it's then a posture. Yeah. You know, and not, it's not, it's, it's, it's unnatural. Have you, have you always done that though, or found that voice? Um, I have, here's the thing. I feel like it's like email talk, you know, I, 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 because I didn't come up in poetry formally, like I didn't really take poetry classes. I, I didn't, I didn't study it when I was an undergrad. Um, I don't have a canonical reverence for poetry itself. So it was always whatever I wanted it to be. And I thought like, well, if it's going to be out there and it's going to reflect me and I'm going to have to read it in front of people, it's going to have to sound like me. It's going to have to look like me. I can't fit any words. The thing I, I can make my voice do almost anything I want it to do. But one thing I can't do is hide when it's like false. If it's, if, if, I, if I'm reading something and it feels false in my mouth, it's going to feel false to you. I learned that early on. Like, I don't think I could fake it till I make it. Cause I'm just like, I just, when I fake it, you could hear it in everything that I do. So I, you know, I'm, I should never play poker because everything that I'm feeling is always written large right across my face. Um, so I guess I, it's my attempt to tame a language, specifically the English language, which was one that was enforced upon uh, indigenous people in this land. And just to be like, no, this is mine now. You you force me to speak in this tongue, but now it's mine, you know. Did you grow up speaking another language? No. Well, the thing is, like, 
the Kumeyaay language in the American side of the United States was eradicated in my grandmother's generation. But there are villages, there are Kumeyaay villages in Mexico because the, the um, half of the nation is in Mexico. And so when I was very, very young, see, my, my father is the tribal chairman of the reservation that I'm from. And um, he, was, he was just gone all the time on business and stuff like that. And my mother worked like, you know, three jobs because it was her dollar that was keeping us afloat way back then. And so uh, for a while, there was a Kumeyaay woman from a village in Mexico who stayed at the house and took care of me. And she spoke Spanish in Kumeyaay. She didn't speak any English. So I grew up speaking Spanish in Kumeyaay. And I had to get better at English once I went to elementary school. That's fascinating. And then she left and I didn't have anybody to practice Spanish or Kumeyaay with. So I don't have them anymore, but I can still kind of affect an accent sometimes. Like when I'm speaking Spanish, people think that I am better at it than I actually am. You know, they, they think that I, I, I actually know Spanish, which is, I know like three words, but I can say them approximately like, uh, like maybe like somebody from Tijuana would. So is that language just dying out? Uh, well, thankfully, because of... Uh, some technological advancements. There are, um, there's like a Kumeyaay language iPad app that people can, you know, um, learn the language on. There are more people from Mexico coming up to the United States side of uh, the Kumeyaay nation and, and, and fostering the language amongst the younger people. So my generation, we don't really speak anything, but the kids now do, which is beautiful. There's like been a resurgence of the language. It's a fascinating twist. And one of the, I mean, one of the misconceptions that I have about Native Americans, you use the word indigenous. Is there a difference between Native American and indigenous? No, I mean, I use, you know, Indian, uh, American Indian, Native American, indigenous, native, just maybe in general. Um, it really, I don't, I don't have a standard for myself about what term I use. Like I was just kind of raised, or sometimes I'll just say Kumeyaay because that's like the nation that I'm from. Um, but, you know, in the book... I use the term Indian, but I spell it NDN, which is like the internet version of Indian, which is like the reason I like it and the reason that I use it is because it in, in my mind, it's like a term of reclamation because people don't know, like non-natives have no idea that NDN means Indian. I had to look it up. Yeah. See, see. So it is, it's, it, it was like the Indian quote unquote was a creation of um, colonialism. Right. Because within Native America, within Indian country, there are so many different tribes and language groups and ethnicities, et cetera. But this idea of the Indian was a created idea. Right. But what NDN, the term via the Internet has done is allowed for a kind of reclamation of the term. Now it's ours. You know. Wow. That's so interesting because that's kind of more or less how I feel about the word queer. Mm. I like that you write there are a lot of misconceptions about Indians, namely everything. Mm -hmm. And it's true because when you say growing up on the reservation, I, I don't even, I can't imagine what that was like. Like, I, I, like I'm wondering if is it, it was it a, uh, like concealed? Like, did you go grocery shopping on there? Did you go to school on there? Like how much uh, communication do you have with like, people beyond the reservation? Um, I can't really speak for all reservations, but on mine in particular, it was very small. So in San Diego County, there are mm, maybe 13, 14, 15 reservations. They're all very small. It, it has the most reservations of any county in the United States, but again, super duper small. So like 500 people, 300 people to a reservation. They're all pretty isolated. But, and are they all part of your nation? Yeah. Oh, okay. But they're not big enough to sustain, or at that time weren't big enough to sustain like an education system or any kind of economic infrastructure really. So we had to go away from the reservation to, like I went to public school, like a bus came through the reservation to pick up the kids. Um, and you know, we'd have to go outside of the reservation to go grocery shopping and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing was that like when I came up, you know, back when people was really poor, um, not everybody had access to a car, you know, so it was like almost like ride sharing back in the day. Yeah. I didn't realize that the reservation was outside of San Diego. Yeah, it's like 40 miles east. It's into the the, the foothills. So it's in East County, San Diego County. Oh, I, I say that because we have such a per perception of Southern California being liberal. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about the reservation being surrounded by people in the KKK and like neo-Nazis. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a weird juxtaposition. Once you get out east, it's scary. 
it's pretty scary. But, you know, I think a lot of people, too, have a liberal facade but carry conservative politics inside of them when it comes to a lot of things. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see that even in Brooklyn where you live? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, just because people think they vote Democrat, it means they're progressive or whatever. But also, you know, there are different kinds of, like, of sexism, racism, homophobia than just somebody being like, it's okay if you like you fags do whatever you want to in your bedroom, you know, that's fine with me or whatever. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't harbor, continue to harbor antagonistic attitudes. But it's almost like if you do this one thing, like if you're okay with gay marriage or like if you're okay with the fact that like your kid has a best friend who's brown or if you're okay with the fact that like, you know, uh, that you're okay with the fact that like a woman has a job, you know, or something like that, that all of a sudden that means that you're a good person. Yeah. I, I see that a lot. Well, I feel like we are in, no, I don't feel like I, we are, we are in this moment right now in the country where we're kind of starting to realize that, you know, black people are not slaves anymore, but maybe they're not equal. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are systems in place that hinder and endanger black people. And I feel like the country's starting to realize that that might exist. And I bring that up because I wonder if there's a sense for Native Americans about, like, what about us? I don't know. Let me try to rephrase this. I don't think many people have ever met an Indian person before, a Native American person before, Indigenous person before, whatever. I think, like... Standing Rock, the whole protest in in the Dakotas or whatever, that was a moment where in like people were kind of like, oh my God, they're still here. Weird, you know. Um, I, I, you know, I, so I, I'm working on a book project right now where I go around and I cook food with uh, people in their kitchens, and somebody asked me, are there, you know, are there food stereotypes against Native American people? And it's like people don't even know enough about us to have a stereotype, you know, for some things. For, for 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 some pop cultural things. I mean, that's not totally true. Like the idea of like the noble savage or the squaw or whatever, like those definitely exist in popular culture. But or like spirit animals. Right. Spirit animals. And, um, you know, my great grandmother was a Cherokee, like all of these little things that people do. Or I ask me, is it true that Eskimos have 50 words for snow? And I'm like, I don't know her. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, that's a fascinating distinction that people don't know enough about Native Americans to stereotype them. Right. I mean, they know uh, enough about us to not want us to be alive, <laughs> but I, th- there has to be some inroads for any people in popular culture before those, you know, the stereotypes exist, like being one with nature. The whole, my whole book was about like why I don't fuck with nature because you expect that because I'm an indigenous person that I fuck with nature. Well, let me tell you, I don't fuck with nature. I fuck with the city or whatever. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. I mean, you mentioned pop culture. The only thing that I can mention is like the Sherman Alexi movie, Smoke Signals. Mm -hmm. And when was that made? The 90s? 97, I think. 98, maybe. Yeah. I mean, and it wasn't even like, it wasn't a big movie by any means. Right. It was an indie darling. Yeah. I mean, Sherman Alexi, we mentioned, he, he wrote a quote for your book. Are you guys like a friend? Is there like a mental relationship? Yeah, you know, we email each other every night. I emailed him today because my book, IRL, was uh, shortlisted for the Brooklyn Public Library's Literature Prize in 2017 in the category of fiction because they didn't even have a category for poetry. And it's like, huh, I've like totally bent your entire concept of genre, haven't I? <laughs> and it's fiction. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. So um, Sherman wrote me a, a quote for that. And, you know, sometimes if something's coming up for him, he'll send me, or if he's like, if, if he's like in an article, he sent me an article a couple of days ago because he had just come out with a memoir called You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. And he was on a book tour and he's feeling really haunted by it because the book is a lot of times about his mother and he was like feeling his mother's presence. So we stopped the book tour and there was an article written about that. So he sent me that article and he was like, you know, pay attention to yourself, take care of yourself, all these kinds of stuff. And then two days ago, he sent me another one that was like, Sherman Alexi's back on the road, you know. So whenever I get anything, whenever I get like an award or some acclaim or a mention somewhere, like I'll send it to him and he does the same for me. That's very nice. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of like he's checking in. Oh, he's a big deal. That's nice to have it on your team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who do you show your poems to when you're like, when you're, or you're happy with it, but it means like a little something. It's missing something. 
Well, now I have an editor oh, at, right. at my press, at Tin House Books. Um, and I, the thing is, I don't write poems, really. I write, like, books. Like, the, my, my purview is, like, the book-length poem. And I don't really feel like I can s- show people pages from it until I have the whole thing done. What I do is I get... I, I, print out like four copies at Kinko's, I coil bind them, and I give them to friends of mine, one of whom is a songwriter, one of them is a a playwright, one of them is a fiction writer, one of them is a poet. And I just hand them a highlighter, and I don't, I like, I'm just like, you know, I'm going to catch these line edits later on, I'm going to use the right words, like there are a lot of these things that I'm going to be able to find out for myself, but will you just highlight if you think something is extraneous, you know, like, so I have like four friends who I send my stuff to, to my books to before I send it to my publisher, just to be like, let me know if there's fat that I can trim off of this. Yes. that That's a great point because so, so the, like the book I'm holding is nature poem. It's a book length poem and seeking out what poem I wanted you to read. It was hard because it's, how do you pull out one bit of the, you know, 80 page poem? Right. Because th- there was a poem I loved about looking up into the stars and you had this quote about, I don't like thinking about nature because nature makes me suspect there is a God. Mm. And then you talk about looking up into the stars and maybe we'll have you read that one, but were you just to read that one, people would think, Oh, it's this little native American boy. who like looks into the heavens and the stars mm-hmm. every night before he goes to bed. Mm-hmm. And it just, it wouldn't, it, it, that's only half the story. Yeah. It it lacks some of the aplomb of the of having the book itself, which is hard when you know journals or magazines or whatever they ask me for excerpts. You know they're like oh you, like literary journals and stuff like that, and it's like it's hard for me to excerpt because it's a book, you know. But I mean, fiction writers and 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 memoirists and nonfiction writers have to do that stuff all the time, you know. But I try hard to find excerpts that seem self-contained enough that they give you something. I'm not so concerned that you don't get everything as long as you get something, you know? Gotcha. So with that as a disclaimer, would you read one for us? Yeah, sure. How about this one? Okay. From Nature Poem. When a star dies, it becomes any number of things, like a black hole or a documentary. The early universe of our skin was remarkably smooth. And now I stand in a rapidly dampening Christina Aguilarity. The first stars were born of a gravity, my ancestors. Our sky is really the only thing same for me as it was for them, which is a pretty stellar inheritance. I don't know how they made sense of that swell, how they survived long enough to make me, and I'm sort of at war with sentimentality generally, but that absence of an answer, yet suggestion of meaning, isn't ultimately that different from a poem. So I've started reading the stars. Nothing is possible until it happens, like digesting sulfur instead of sunlight or friends with benefits. Poems were my scripture, and the poets, my gods. But even gods, I mean especially gods, are subject to the artifice of humanity. I look up at the poem, all of them up there in the hot sky, and fall into the water, a stone. Thanks. Yeah. So the poem mentions your your ancestors. You're a part of, is it a 10,000-year-old culture? Is that how long it is? I believe that's how long it is. But you know what? Carbon dating keeps pushing that back further and further. So really, yeah. Oh my god. Do you do you feel that? Like, if, like for me, my family's been in America for three generations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's there's nothing for me to feel beyond like Ellis Island, maybe. But do do you feel? I don't even know what the question is, but like that lineage in you? Absolutely. I think that the reason why I am here, I mean, obviously, like the reason that I'm here is that I come from survivors. You know, I come from people who were like, who who put their fucking like axe in the ground and were like, we're not going anywhere or had to survive somehow. They, there, there, there are some, had to be some resilience and canniness to them to be able to live this far into an invader occupation. I walk around all day knowing that like I'm still occupied, you know, um, But there is that, I don't really believe in, 
like God or whatever. I'm not a spiritual person, but I do believe in the concept of ancestor worship because I'm thankful to those people. And so I feel them and their strength all the time. I mean, I can, I hear it in my own voice, you know, like I know that I came from people who are ancient and special and, 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 and who, who are strong. And especially when I'm back home and I know I'm, in the place where they have, where they lived for 10,000 years, that I do feel insanely connected to the place that I'm from, which is a thing that the character in nature poem has to come to terms with that. Like, is it stereotypical if I feel connected to the land? I don't answer that question, but it's just poems aren't there to answer questions. They're just there to ask them, you know? So is this is, this character is, it's not an autobiographical autobiograph- work, but it is, is like almost, right? It's, it's like a version of you. It's influenced by me, but I had to create a persona in order to write my books just because, again, this is the thing about intimidation. If I wrote it as me, if that character was named Tommy Pico, I would feel way too precious about what I was writing, and I don't think I would have been able to write it the same way. But if it's Teebs, and first of all, Teebs can take care of himself, you know what I mean? Teebs is a fucking scrappy bitch. But if it's as Teebs, I don't feel as as exposed. You know, I get to... I, I push a character around a page, and he has the same similar inclinations to me. But I think of like I'm pretty even keeled and mild mannered, and uh, I don't you know disturb the water too much. But Teebs is like he's in your kitchen, he's drinking all of your alcohol, he pissed all over your bathroom, he stole your man, you know what I mean? And then he's gone before you get back. Like he's just he's like a ten like as angry, as in love, as hungry, as, as charming, as funny, um, as loud as I could possibly be, you know, at all times. And, and Teeves, you're saying, is, is the character, mm-hmm. just for people listening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, I guess, goes back to the earlier conversation about, are you, like, afraid to write about sex? I guess it's, it's Teeves, it's not you. It ain't me. <laughs> it ain't me, babe. That's amazing. <laughs> it, was IRL your first book also, Teeves? Yes. IRL was my first book length poem. And before that I had written smaller poems and the constant criticism that I would get actually was like, this feels like it stopped a little short. Like, I think this is good, could, could go on for longer. Your book length poem was short. No, no, no. My, the shorter poems that I was writing before that, that was a constant critique that I was getting was that they were short. They were too short. They, like they needed something. I feel like they want to keep going. And so my challenge to myself with IRL, with my first book was just keep going. And I went on for a hundred pages almost. Um, But yeah, that was my first book with Teebs as the main character. And he is, he slimed his way all over that book. He did well. He did well. Yeah. When you were talking earlier about the resilience of your people as coming from Native Americans, I feel like that entire conversation could have been said about queerness Mm. and queer identity. Mm -hmm. And I just, well, uh, first I want to ask about that in in your culture, but also can you tell me what it means to be two-spirit? Because I hear conflicting definitions. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't personally, I I don't buck the identity. Um, I don't personally identify as two spirit because in my mind, in the, that, that's a definition that I learned. It's not really one that I sort of grew up with or one that I understood necessarily, but the way that I've, I've, I've come to understand the term and the, what it means is that, um, that not only are you of to of of different worlds like in i think literally it's just like that that you possess like sort of masculine and feminine traits or something that's like it's on some spectrum of queerness but that it also um equates to a role that you have in the tribe since so, so- i don't i don't live on the reservation i live in brooklyn and i'm i so i just couldn't call myself like gay or queer or whatever. But if somebody were to uh, like announce me as like a two spirit, I wouldn't say that's not me. And it's a similar thing to like saying person of color. Like I am really light skinned. And so I wouldn't go out there and identify myself as a person of color. 
But I will, if somebody introduces me or calls me a person of color, I'm not going to correct them. You know, I mean, I'm Indian, I'm native, but like, because of like some passing privilege that I have, some light skin privilege that I have, I wouldn't call myself brown or I wouldn't call myself a person of color. I I did study some of this stuff when I was in college that, and, and, you know, it's not, the, the irony isn't lost on me that I had to learn about a lot of my history in anthropological articles that white people had written about Kumeyaay people. But there were in so many indigenous communities, if not all of them, the recognition of other genders and sexualities. There wasn't the binary that people have enforced upon us. So the gender roles that we have inherited or and the, the attitudes towards sexuality that people assume, they're assimilated. There was another way of life before this one, you know? Yeah. So, uh, sorry to, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry for that. No problem. But, uh, but, but I guess you led me to where I wanted to go, which was how accepting is queerness in your community? In, on my reservation in particular, I didn't leave because I felt, uh, I didn't leave because I felt like assaulted or uh, there, I didn't get any homophobia from anybody there. And when I left, there was a, a member of the tribal council who was gay and he lived with his partner and they had kids. And I know I have cousins right now who are married to their partners, their, their same sex partners or whatever. Like, so I don't, I didn't grow up feeling like that kind of stigma from my relatives or from people on the reservation. I got it from people outside the reservation. I got it from people at public school. That's where I learned how to hide or I couldn't hide. I've always been a fucking fairy. Um, that's where I learned. I mean, that's where I learned self-hatred. You know, that's, that's when I felt oppressed and the oppression becomes self-hatred. And that's how I learned how to not like myself. You know, it was never from my own community. When you were growing up in the uh, in the community uh, on the reservation, d- did you think you'd live there forever? Absolutely. I didn't know anybody who left and stayed gone. I knew people who left for jobs sometimes, but they always came back. Everybody always comes back. I'm going to be buried there. I don't intend. I don't think I. I don't think I at this point in my life see myself living there anytime soon. Circumstances could change though, but. It's important for me right now to be doing the work that I'm doing and in order to write the stuff that I have to write and in order to make the, the cultural artifacts that I want to make, it requires that I be in a city. It requires that I pretty much be in New York, you know, at this point in my life. You, you the, the two things you named are pointed towards your community in a, in a loving way mm-hmm. when I was thinking that you're trying to like also by default change like public perception, even like an inch. Mm-hmm. about Native people. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a, it's a byproduct. Well, um, that could potentially be an effect of the work that I make. But to be honest with you, the reason that I wrote so much and so often and continue to all the time and produce as much culture as I possibly can is that, again, in my grandmother's generation, it was scrubbed from history. But because I'm Kumeyaay, anything that I make is Kumeyaay. That book, Nature Poem, is Kumeyaay. IRL is a Kumeyaay epic. It's the only Kumeyaay epic that exists, you know? And anything, so anything, if if I'm Kumeyaay and anything that I make is Kumeyaay, the more stuff I make, the more Kumeyaay artifacts exist in the world. So for me, it's a way of asserting that not only are we still here, but we are capable of producing works beautiful works of culture a beautiful cultural work but also that like that we deserve to and that you should know about us you know yeah you said that you thought you'd live your whole life in the reservation what did when did that change i went off to college and i i mean even even when i was there i thought after four years i would go back initially i was um a pre-med major. So I took only science courses and math courses. And I thought I was going to go to medical school. And I thought I was going to cure diabetes, type 2 diabetes on Indian reservations because um, type 2 diabetes is an endemic disease in Indian country. My father's diabetic. So many of my relatives are diabetic. And so I was like, okay, 
I'm going to go, I went to Sarah Lawrence College to do writing, but I got there and I was surrounded by a lot of really, really, really wealthy, generationally wealthy people. And I was really intimidated to become of them because at that time I didn't understand that education and intelligence aren't the same thing. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, especially when you look at like fucking grinder profiles and shit and people are like educated and I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? What is a, what does that mean to you? What is that a proxy for? Because it sounds like classism to me. It sounds like income inequality to me. Anyway, so at Sarah Lawrence that I was going to be a writer. I was too intimidated by all of the rich people who knew all of these words that I didn't. So I thought that meant I was stupid and and, and, and engaging in a subjective discipline such as poetry, it's really easy to feel like you're not doing it right. And because I was already feeling that sort of socially in the, in the place that I was, I thought I was doing it even worse than I, than I did when I got to Sarah Lawrence. I thought that, I was right, that my writing was even worse than it was. So I decided to try my hand at a discipline that was completely objective, which is, well, at that time, I thought it was objective. I, I have more thoughts on it now, but like science and medicine, it was just like, if I study hard enough, if I memorize this textbook, if I understand these physical laws, if I can balance this equation, I can get the right answer. I was just looking for the right answer. I needed something to give me the right answer. But like four years of studying science and medicine, I graduated, I wrote my senior thesis on genetic susceptibility to type 2 diabetes. And my advisor signed off on it. And he's like, this sounds like a great project. And the more I studied the genetics behind type 2 diabetes, the more I started to understand that while there might be a genetic component to it, you're not born destined to be a type 2 diabetic what that is an out uh, that that outcome occurs because you don't have access to good food that you don't have access to nutritional information that there aren't public health initiatives in place to ensure that you don't get it, it's a social disease and any type of intervention that would actually have an effect on people's health costs money right? But medication, it makes money for people. It makes money for, for pharmaceutical companies. And so I kind of lost all faith in medicine and science and math and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I graduated and I didn't matriculate to medical school. And also I, I thought if these diseases are social in nature, then maybe there is a way I could, I could con I could contribute to the, if not eradication of these social diseases, at least like if I could help alleviate them in some way, in a social way, in a cultural way. If, if, if I, cause I thought, you know, if I studied really hard, if I did everything that I wanted to do, if I, if I, if I, if I got everything right, I could maybe be like a B plus doctor. But if I worked really hard, I could probably be an A-plus poet. And maybe that, my, maybe my contribution could be social. That, like, by putting these books out there, by, like, you know, writing movies or whatever, by, like, um, by exercising my creative capacity, that I could have more of an impact on my community than I could as, a, as like, a doctor treating one person at a time. Well, you're doing a great job so far. Thank you. Yeah. Before I let you go, will you tell me about Two of your tattoos. Okay. <laughs> which one is your, like the which one means the most to you? Mm, I'll just tell you about a couple of them. So like there, I have a f there, I have two genres of tattoo on my body. One of them is that I have a, a several basket designs. They're ancient kumiai basket designs. They're found on baskets in the place that I grew up in, the valley that I lived in, and in the region of the United States that my people occupy. And they were just reminders to me because I, I got them, you know, after I graduated college. So I got them, many of them in my 20s. And they were there to remind me of where I came from, you know, so that every time I looked at my arms or, you know, my thigh or whatever, like I would remember that like there is something ancient in Kumiai that is still a part of me. So it was like something physical to denote something interior. Um, there are, I have other like, tattoos there's a one on my left arm 
that is one of my favorite things ever. And it's a drawing from an opera textbook, a turn of the century opera textbook that shows where you, it's like an anatomical drawing basically, but it shows where you inhale air, um, the resonators that you push it out of, and then what note it would hit on the scale for tenors and sopranos. So it's like this um, opera technique book. From uh, Did you study opera? No, I'm just like fascinated with human voices. I'm fascinated with singing voices. My parents are singers. Um, my sister was on Broadway in like the mid 90s. She was like in Showboat, which is like this revival of Showboat, I think with Elaine Stritch. Um, and, you know, my, my, my father sings traditional kumiya music and my mother was the director of the choir at church. And, you know, she still has an amazing singing voice. And I, and my brother's like completely tone deaf. So I feel like I'm in between the two of them. <laughs> Fascinating. Last one. What about the rose you just got recently? Oh my hand? God. I love that's my favorite one now too. Um, I found a, so I have a Pinterest page for my tattoos. Um, as I think about getting them, I get maybe like one or two a year. And recently I've taken to Pinterest to figure out some things that I like. And I found this drawing on Pinterest and I was like, this is amazing. And I took it to the tattoo artist and I was like, I wanted the top, the bud to be in red and then the rest of the stem to be in like the regular tattoo color. But he was like, let me try something. And he kind of filled in every other part red. So it, it like, it has like a sort of like, it, it looks, it looks like it's lifting to a certain extent, or it's like, it's like, I don't know, it's like on fire. It's, it, 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 it cut it up in a way that made it way more interesting and way better. And I was like, Gary, you're my guy now. <laughs> you're the guy I'm going to go to whenever I want to get a tattoo because you just took my idea and made it better. And frankly, I'm not used to that happening too often. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having this. me. Yeah. If people want to find out more about you, I know you sometimes delete Twitter. Where should we send them to <laughs> that's active? Well, the reason I go on and off social media is because oftentimes I have like projects, excuse me, that I have to finish. Um, I think the most reliable face, face, I think the most reliable place to find me on is Tumblr, actually. Heytebs.tumblr.com. That's H E Y T E E B S dot tumblr.com. If I happen to be on Facebook, uh, I don't never on Facebook. I don't have Facebook no more. But if I happen to be on Twitter, you can find me at Heytebs or Instagram also. Instagram.com slash Heytebs, H E Y T E B S. And as always, tweeting at me is the easiest way to recommend guests. I tweet from Jeff Masters one. I love hearing from you. And I also love reading your iTunes review. So please go leave that as soon as we're done here and we're done right now. So rank us five stars, leave us a comment. It's so appreciated. And for this episode, we want a special thanks to Elon University in Los Angeles for their studio. Okay, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.